السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين دبيبهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد This is Dr. Ahmed Muhammad. I'm the resident director of Youth and Young Adult Islamic Studies at the ICJ. Uh, today, inshallah, I would like to start a, a series uh, that I called Ramadan Fiqh Bits. Um, and this is for the purpose of preparing for Ramadan. Uh, inshallah, Ramadan is less than a week away. Um, and it's always recommended that prior to when we start Ramadan, uh, that we review some of the rulings associated with it, uh, inshallah, so that we would enter Ramadan uh, prepared for it, knowing the, in the back of our minds some of the rulings associated with it. But also, it's an act of worship. Uh, when we seek this type of knowledge, uh, it is an act of worship, inshallah, and that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, as the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned in hadith, whomever seeks a, a means or a way or road to seek knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with it facilitates for him a means or a road to Jannah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, allow us to be among those individuals and to give us the reward of the time that we spent learning some of these things. So that being said, um, inshallah, the purpose of this uh, is not to go into all the details that have to do with advanced levels of uh, jurisprudence and fiqh, but just to cover quickly some of the basic and principles uh, teachings that are associated uh, with uh, with the Ramadan, um, and we're gonna do it from the perspective of, uh, or according to the school of an Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah, who is one of the obviously the four uh, great Imams uh, whose teachings have been preserved and taught throughout the world. Uh, in addition to Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, uh, the last one of them was Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And so we're going to be basing on that uh, so that we won't kind of branch into two different, the, the multiple different opinions. Uh, so as much as we can, we can make these sessions uh, short. Um, uh, the other thing, inshallah, we're going to be doing is we're going to make these uh, episodes and these sessions uh, small, uh, short, inshallah, uh, about 10 to 15 minutes maximum. Uh, hopefully, inshallah, in the range within 10 minutes, uh, so that they would truly be actually fiqh bits that we uh, kind of take. So that being said, uh, today, this is the first one, and we're going to be covering uh, just basically introduction, some of the virtues associated with Ramadan, and then the definition that's associated with fasting, uh, because this will give us a, a great outline of the different things we're going to be covering throughout these sessions based on that definition. Um, so in terms of an introduction, Ramadan um, is the fourth pillar in Islam. Uh, and so considering it's a fourth pillar, it's a rukn, uh, it's considered an individual obligation. Um, and there's uh, two different types of obligation. There's a communal obligation and an individual obligation. Communal obligations means that uh, it's the responsibility of the community. It's obligated on generally for the community uh, to fulfill it. Uh, such as, for example, as Salat al-Janazah, the prayer for the deceased, uh, such as uh, establishing a Eid or a Juma, ah, it's a communal uh, obligation. Um, even even some of the other basic sciences, such as medicine, for example, right? It's a communal obligation that we train and provide enough doctors so that they would uh, medically take care of the sick of the Muslims. Um, however, in certain situations, such as the one we're talking about over here, there are individual obligations. Uh, such as prayers, right, which is the second pillar in Islam. Um, and now this is the fourth one. It is fasting, right? Uh, it means that it's responsibility for each one of us to perform it. Nobody can perform it on somebody else's behalf. Now, the reason I'm mentioning it's an individual obligation is because it's important for us to understand uh, that there are a type of knowledge uh, that is mandatory for us individually upon each one of us to learn. Um, and this is usually associated with the individual obligation. Uh, so, for example, when we come of age, when it has to do with prayers, it's actually mandatory for us to go learn the rulings of prayers, uh, the pillars, the uh, mandatory actions, the nullifiers of the prayers, the prerequisites of prayers, so that when we act uh, upon these acts of worship, uh, that they would be performed um, properly in a way that would please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that they would be accepted, uh, so that we'd be careful not to do anything that would nullify um, our act of worship. Similarly, when it comes to fasting Ramadan, it's, a, it's an individual obligation uh, for us that we have to go seek the knowledge associated uh, so that we could uh, properly practice this beautiful act of worship, uh, which is fasting. Um, the, the Ramadan, it was, when it was first made obligatory, it was made obligatory in the second year of Hijrah, uh, after the Prophet ﷺ had migrated to Medina. Um, and so... Uh, prior to that, it did not mean that the Muslims were not fasting. No, they used to fast a lot, some recommendation fasting. Uh, and prior to Ramadan, they were Muslims were obligated to fast the day of Muharram, if I remember correctly. Uh, but afterwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had replaced it by the fasting of Ramadan. And so the Prophet ﷺ fasted nine Ramadans uh, from when it was revealed until the death 
of the Prophet Now there are obviously a special virtues that are associated with fasting. Um, we tend to hear these every single year. But it's a good thing that we kind of cover some of this uh, to kind of uh, recharge our, our desire and, 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 and our spirituality so that we would inshallah go into this uh, desiring to do the act of worship in the best way possible. So I'm just going to mention about uh, like a couple, two or three hadiths associated with this. Uh, the first one uh, is narrated by Abu Hurairah anhu when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he said, uh, or like, you know, when, when the month of Ramadan would enter, he would say, Atakum shahr Ramadan, shahr Mubarak, Faradallahu alaykum siyamahu. تفتح تفتح فيها أبواب الجنة وتغلق فيها أبواب الجحيم وتغل فيها مرض الشياطين وفيها ليلة خير من ألف شهر من حرم خيرها فقد حرم أن النظر نريشن وينادى مناد كل ليلة يا باغي الخير أقبل ويا باغي الشر أقصر ولله عتقاء من النار وذلك كل ليلة. so the gist of this hadith the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is showing some of the virtues. Um, in fact the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he would be so excited about Ramadan entering he would um, uh, like you know, talk to his companions and give him the glad tidings, and he'll say, "A month of Ramadan has come to you." Like, "Ata kum shahr Ramadan." Like, you know, Ramadan has come to you, right? He's so excited about it, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then he would say that it is a month that Allah subhanahu wa taala has made obligatory upon you to fast it. And he then he would talk about some of the virtues. He would say that in it, uh, the the heavens of the gates of heavens are completely open, and the gates of hells are closed, and the shayateen are have been chained. Um, and in it, in this month, there is a night that is better than a thousand months. Whomever is deprived from its, um, who is ever deprived from its benefit, then he truly is deprived. Um, and then another narration of Prophet ﷺ would also continue saying that a caller would call, O desirer of good, uh, or desirer of, um, uh, like you know, the desire of goodness, approach and desire of evil, refrain. So don't do any bad things in Ramadan. This is a blessed month. It has a sanctity to it, so don't do it. And then he would say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that to Allah there belongs a group of individuals. Uh, they are emancipated, means, means that they have been freed from the hellfire, and this is, is in every night. Which means that in the month of Ramadan, it has a virtue that every night is an opportunity to free ourselves, emancipate ourselves from the hellfire. Which means that those individuals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has blessed that he would free them from the hellfire, he means that they would not enter it. He means they would enter Jannah. This is a very beautiful virtue of Ramadan and a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which would encourage us to do our best uh, when we, when this blessed month enters, that we fast in the best way possible, that we guard our fasting, prevent it from like you know, being reduced in terms of its reward, so that inshallah all of us uh, would be among those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would free uh, in Ramadan from the hellfire. Now the uh, second hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu would remind the companions and, and give them this virtue and God tiding. He would tell them, So the Prophet Sallam would say, whomever fasts Ramadan uh, in Iman, in a state of Iman, in belief, uh, seeking the reward of it, then his previous sins will be forgiven. And then also whomever stands in Ramadan, or sorry, in Laylatul Qadr, means standing in prayers in Laylatul Qadr, in state of Iman, believing, uh, and seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then his previous sins will be forgiven. And so this is a great opportunity, once again, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a great mercy, that he presents these uh, like, you know, opportunities that our sins will be forgiven. Because it's our sins that tend to keep us distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that tend to uh, make us liable to being punished. Uh, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is... Uh, presenting us with this beautiful best month so that our sins will be forgiven. Now the second virtue and that comes in hadith also has to do with standing Ramadan. Now this previous one mentions just Laylatul al Qadr but the other hadith also clarifies uh, the Prophet Sallallahu would say whomever Ramadan, whoever stands in Ramadan in praying Iman and Muhtisaban in belief and seeking the reward then his previous sins would be forgiven. This is referring specifically for Taraweeh so it's not just Laylatul al Qadr. So this is some of the quick virtues. Now, what is the definition of fasting? What does it mean? Now, fasting in the Arabic language, its root means to refrain. Like linguistically, it means to withhold or refrain and abstain from something. This is what it means to me. This is why in the verse of the Quran, uh, when, when Maryam alayhi salam, she went back after she had given birth to Isa alayhi salam, she said in the Quran, إِنِّ سُمْتِ لِلرَّحْمَانِ فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْسِيَّةِ That I have fasted for the sake of Allah Taala, and so I'm not going to talk to anybody today. So the fast he's talking about over here is to refrain from speaking. So this comes from the linguistic term. Now the technical term of it, when we think about fasting in Shara, 
the definition of it is to intentionally refrain from specific things during a specific time by a specific person. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna break this down a little bit more into categories to make this a bit easier, right? So here are the three categories we're talking about, um, and I, I numbered them a bit differently because inshallah, based on these numbers, we're gonna be discussing the remainder of the sessions. So over here it says to intentionally, right? So it requires intention uh, to intentionally fast uh, with like you know from specific things. So these specific things are referring to the nullifiers. So you're withholding from committing specific things during that fast and a specific time from a specific person. So based on these categories, you can see now what we're going to be discussing in these sessions and what are the main things we're going to be talking about. So when intention, for example, when we talk about intention, we're going to address like, you know, why is this important and how do we have this intention and when are we supposed to have it? Uh, when it comes to refraining from specific things, it's talking about the nullifiers of fasting. So we're going to talk about those, but also we're going to talk about the expiations. Uh, associated with uh, what if happens if we have committed specific acts uh, of nullifiers. Um, and then when it comes to time, we're going to be addressing um, how do we determine the beginning and the end of Ramadan, uh, but also what part of the day we're supposed to be fast. Obviously, the majority of us know this, but because they are discussed in the books of fiqh, we're going to cover it quickly. Uh, now, when we talk about specific person, uh, we're talking about over here, who is it obligatory upon to fast? But also, we also address who is excused from fasting. Uh, so those are the broad terms. Today, inshallah, and in, in just like inshallah, a minute or two, uh, I would like to cover uh, the first one, which is intention. Right? Why do we need this intention? How do we have this intention? How does it come to be? And when are we supposed to have this intention? Um, so the why aspect, obviously, is because we have to have intention because this is an act of worship. Any time we perform an act of worship, it requires an intention. Uh, that is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to seek the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, to obey the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's also important because some acts that we perform can sometimes be uh, mixed or similar to some of the habitual things we do. I'll give an example. Nowadays, uh, many people, they practice in their diet something that's called intermittent fasting. So they withhold from eating or sometimes even drinking. So they have a wet, like, you know, intermittent fasting and a dry intermittent fasting. And so they hold from eating um, until a certain time of period and then they start eating. So a person who's not eating uh, because of their dieting and a person who's fasting, they look pretty much the same. What really differentiates one from the other is that intention. Right. Um, another, for example, situation is a person woke up in the morning, they were late, they're kind of running late, so they didn't eat or drink, they rushed out of the house, and they had no time because they're busy throughout the day until they came back at home at Maghrib. Well, this person did not eat or drink the entire day. Are they considered fasting? No, because they did not have an intention. This is where intention is important. Uh, uh, but this intention is also important uh, because it differentiates between two similar acts of worship. All right. Uh, in our case of fasting, for example, it differentiates between the mandatory fast of Ramadan and the voluntary fast. Uh, and this really comes in apparent or important when we're talking about people who have to make up the fasting of Ramadan out of once Ramadan is, once Ramadan is done uh, and, and it's any other casual day. So, for example, they decided to fast on a Monday. Right. Is this fast on Monday? Is it because it's a sunnah? Or is it because it's an obligation, the makeup of Ramadan? This is where the intention comes in. And so this is why it's important. Now, how do we make that intention? Uh, we're, it's not that difficult. Intention really stems from the heart. It's what your intent, why are you doing it, to whom you're doing it. Um, and so it really comes from your heart. And so really you're just going to intend that you're fasting a day of Ramadan. Specifically, we're talking about Ramadan over here. That you're just going to fast an obligation for Ramadan. Um, if you set up your alarm, right? Um, and you wake up for suhoor, if you wake up for suhoor actually, or set up your alarm and even you slept didn't miss it, that in itself counts as an intention because you're setting it for, for a reason. And so if you wake up for suhoor in the Hamid school of thought, that itself is an intention, right? So you don't have to re-intend anything else. Uh, when you set up the alarm, that is an intention. And so you don't need anything else. So you're intending because you're doing it to fast next day for Ramadan. Now, do you have to verbalize that intention? Do you have to say, I intend to fast Ramadan tomorrow or I have to intend some fault? No, you don't have to verbalize it, right? Uh, it's not required, period. Uh, in fact, like, you know, like, you know, you should, like, you know, uh, there's a dispute between the scholars whether you should be doing that or not, but it's not a, it's not a prerequisite. It's not a, a condition for your fast to be valid. Uh, now, do we, uh, like, you know, do you, do you need to intend that this is a fault, an act of obligation? 
Once again, no, it's sufficient that you just intend that it is Ramadan. Uh, now, when do you have to make this intention? If it's an obligatory fast, fast then you have to intend. So if it's an obligatory fast, uh, then this intention of fasting has to be done prior to Fajr, before it. Uh, the reason behind it is because when it comes to Ramadan, we're obligated to fast the entire day. And the only way this is possible is if you make that intention before Fajr time. So that it counts. If you intend after Fajr, then you're missing part of the day, then it doesn't count, right? Then it can be tra like, you know, transferred right away into some sort of another act of fasting. Uh, but this also comes from the hadith of Prophet ﷺ when he said, Whomever does not intend, right, to make that fast, to fast it during the night time, right, um, before Fajr time comes out, then there is no fasting for him. This is referring to the Fard, the mandatory fast. Um, what about the voluntary fast? The voluntary fast is different. Uh, the voluntary fast, you're allowed to, uh, uh, like, you know, to, to make that decision to fast during any time of the day, right? With the condition, of course, the prerequisites that, that you not commit, did not commit any of the nullifiers of fasting, because otherwise, then you already uh, cannot do it. Uh, and this is kind of important because, uh, it's, like, you know, when it comes to voluntary acts, uh, the Sharia ah makes it easier for us to perform it. Uh, so for example, this is why when it comes to the uh, extra acts of worship of prayers, for example, the nawafil of prayers, uh, like, you know, standing up, it doesn't become a, a, a pillar of it. Uh, you can do it while sitting down. Yes, you get half the reward, but things are made easier. Uh, if you're riding a mount or in a car and you decide you want to pray sunnah, you can do it while sitting, uh, provided that you might turn, turn to the qibla first before starting. And so there are concessions that are made in voluntary acts of worship. Uh, and so this is one of the concessions that you can start fasting during the day. It doesn't matter if Dhuhr passed, if Asr time passed. Uh, however, yes, your reward for getting for the fast is less than when you start from the uh, beginning of the day. That reward starts from the intention that you had made. Um, and the Prophet ﷺ, sometimes he would do this. He would wake up in the morning, uh, go past by his uh, household, his family, and he asked, do you have any breakfast? If they said no, then he would say, then in Asa'im, Allahumma inni. So, uh, we'll stop here inshallah. This is the end of our first session. Uh, next time inshallah we'll talk about the other parts uh, that are associated with the deficient. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanahu wa bihamdika. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.